Yes, exactly. Like, like, I would say, leave your pod behind. But, uh, yeah, and ten, the shape of the property is like a pot where up top here it's like the narrow point and it kind of winds up the further up the hill we go. So it's like down there, kind of our little like smaller field. This is kind of like our little terrace where we'll do some of the other more uh, production side of things. And then further up to the next terrace is where my new my main field is, and then at the very top, that's where my, my parents' house is, you know, so it's not too bad to commute, I just kind of roll out of bed and I'm out of work, so can't complain too much on that end. So, coming on down over here, we'll, well, we got, we're right next to a nice little Criollo tree, we don't have to go all the way down here. So, cacao can grow, it can only grow 20 degrees north and south of the equator, so it's like a real narrow band around the earth where it's grown. As far as here in Hawaii, um, you know, people often refer to us as the North Pole of chocolate making because the Big Island is at about like 18 degrees north of the equator and Kauai, the northernmost island, is at like 22 degrees. So we're like right on the edge where you can actually grow it there. So it is actually kind of like the coldest environment. Well, Maui's in a pretty good spot. Kauai, it's actually technically like two degrees beyond where they should be able to grow it. but. I know some guys over there growing, seems to be working out all right, so, you know, uh, I guess it, it can um, work out, but the last winter was actually pretty cold, cold for us, you know, like 60 degrees or whatever, and uh, I heard that their crops got, you know, kind of beat up a little bit in Kauai. Uh, for us here, it just kind of started a little bit late, but uh, yeah, in, and in a place like South Florida, you can actually like grow like little like... Uh, bonsai cacao trees but it's not going to produce the fruit of the cacao like what i got in my pocket here and when you feel that most of the weight you're feeling is the outside husk of the pod you know mm -hmm. what i mean so yeah. all the good stuff's inside so don't start licking it thinking it's going to taste like chocolate you know and in, once you crack it open inside that's where the beans were of course that's what we use to make the chocolate but there's also this like white citrusy goo that like surrounds each bean, mm -hmm. which is actually like really sweet tasting. Don't ask me how people figured out how to like turn fruit into chocolate. I'm glad I didn't have to figure out that whole end of it. It's like, you know, like those folks in California, they got like artichokes. It's like, like how desperate were you to like think that you can eat that thing and just start scraping leaves and stuff. It's but delicious. Yeah, it tastes <laughs> good. And you know, I'm thinking, what I think of it as is like, it's probably like starvation was like the motivation there. It's like, all right, we're out of the good stuff. Let's just start working with this. And I think cacao is kind of in a similar uh, category on that end, but kind of how it starts off, we're just coming into the blooming season right now. So you can see these tiny little white flowers here and they're pointing downward. And that's because it's not bees that pollinate it. It's these little, uh, little gnats called midges, which kind of like to float around and nibble up at your ankles and stuff, which is kind of good that we didn't go down into the, uh, uh, all the way down, because on a sunny day like today, they kind of like to go crazy. But as obnoxious as they are, I am super grateful for them, because it's the only thing that actually pollinates the uh, cacao trees. And I see my neighbor down the street, she does uh, vanilla and she has to hand pollinate each flower with a paintbrush. And I'm like, okay, I'm glad I don't have to do all that. I can deal with breathing in little gnats and getting my ankles nibbled up during the harvest. I can deal with that, you know? So, and uh, it's kind of a cool sta uh, stage that you guys came because it's like just towards the end of the harvesting season. So you gotta kind of get to see the whole thing where you look at the flower here and once it's pollinated, you see that little tiny pod there. That's kind of how it starts off. And over a period of about like three months, they'll get bigger and bigger, right up to the fully matured cacao pods like you see here. Now these are much smaller. They're obviously, this tree is a bit stunted, this particular one. In addition to that, I'm pretty sure this is a Criollo, which is one of the varieties that isn't super high yield. Um, that being said, uh, I do have a couple Criollo trees that have a pretty decent but and you can see with the different color I mean they come in a lot of different colors and that doesn't necessarily dictate what variety they are I mean most common is gonna be yellow like you see there but you know they get this kind of tequila sunrise look going on sometimes they could stay a purplish deep deep red like these guys over here um, sometimes they'll stay green the whole time so kind of how I determine ripeness and and Again, that doesn't determine the variety, but it acts as like a camouflage against an insect that luckily enough doesn't exist here in Hawaii. 
um, but it's in South America and it kind of confuses the insect so it can't tell the difference between the pods and the leaves. So really all it's doing is confusing me when I have to do my harvest. I'm like, <laughs> all right, which one's ripe? You know, because, you know, I, I remember... Uh, it's like when I, knocking on watermelons. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> what, is that? what are they listening for? What are they, I don't know. It looks like they know what they're talking about there. Oh, hey, how's it going? <laughs> and uh, what is it called? So what... I've determined because when I would, when I first started, I'd do these harvests and I'd just like harvest all this stuff and I'd be like, oh, it's yellow, that means it's good to go. Green, not so much. And in the heat of the harvest, sometimes I'd harvest a green pot or two, and I'm like, you know what? I, I harvest it. I might as well see what's inside, and I'd crack it open. And it'd be good to go. And then sometimes the yellow ones wouldn't be quite there yet. So I'm like, all right, what's going on here? How can I figure this out? And kind of, I've done enough harvests now where I could tell from the outside ridges. Uh, whether it's good to go or not and the color as well but kind of my triple check is I'll scratch the outside of the pod there and you see how it's that like orange kind of yellowy color mm -hmm. so if it's yellow orange or a very very light green then it's good to go if it's a dark green then it's not quite there yet and I've had yellow pods scratch green and green pods scratch yellow uh, so you know it could be kind of fun on that aspect of the uh, the harvest there but uh, so there are three major varieties of cacao. Uh, what I'm holding in my hand here, and uh, most of the trees in my field, with the, it's, uh, uh, it's gonna be the most common variety, which is Forestero. It represents like 95 plus percent of all the chocolate you eat in the world. Reasons for that being is that it's just a farmer's favorite, where it's relatively easy to grow, it's resilient against different like weather condition. It doesn't get beat up by the sun or by wind as easily as some of the other varieties. And it has a pretty decent yield as far as cacao goes. Generally speaking, like a pot about this size will get me one dark chocolate bar at about an ounce and a half. Um, and that's on the good side of things, you know? So when you look around and you see a, a pod, you can think one pod, one chocolate bar. Now, of course, with milk chocolate, I can kind of stretch that out a little bit, get a little bit more out of it, you know what I mean? But uh, with the um, dark chocolate, it's one pod, one pod. Now with the Criollo, which is this tree over here, um, and I actually do have quite a bit of it, that only represents about like three to 5% of all the chocolate you eat in the world. It's a much more rare variety, debatably one of the rarest. And uh, reasons for that is it's like, you know, the tree's like the same size as a Forestero tree but the pods are so much smaller. You crack it open, the beans inside are much smaller. And your average farmer's like, hey man, I'm paying all this money for, you know, or I'm like, uh, you know, get the same size tree and I'm getting so much less yield. I'm just gonna go with Forestero. So most farmers have like moved away from Criollo in the past. It's kind of changed up a little bit because when we first started growing in 2005, you know, the uh, university at Oahu was all like, oh, you're growing, um, you're going cacao where you take all these Criollo trees and I'm like, all right, free tree, sure. So I've actually do have quite a bit on property that were given to me by the university. They, they have a, an interest in keeping that genetic variety alive because they believe that it's closer related to like the heirloom cacao of like ancient South America. So for like conservation reasons, they want to hold on to that. But with the, um, uh, it's, it's just more susceptible also in addition to it not yielding as much it's more susceptible to sun damage wind damage things like that but I was like hey I'll just I'll throw them in here I like having a nice variety of things that being said more and more people are growing it for you know some people conservation reasons others because like some French chocolatier was like oh it has this superior flavor so like the market value all like uh -huh. increased and stuff like that and I'm like alright I got you know a decent amount of uh, Criollo trees and I got a okay amount of free time so I'm gonna separate out these beans and see if there is any like real major flavor difference and uh, there is a difference but to say it's better is super subjective you know what I mean it's like chocolate's chocolate it's gonna be good um, I feel like it has like a stronger aftertaste opposed to the Forestero that's kind of like right there with you um, but to say it's superior I think it's the scarcity that's created that market value more than it being like this amazing blow your hair back sort of uh, um, you know taste you know that being said when I do my chocolate I like to blend them all together I think they do a nice little dance all the different varieties so when you are tasting my chocolate it's got all three of the varieties I carry here on property blended all into the same stuff so you're getting some of that curry yo-yo in there as well um, 
Oh, and although it's a, a pretty rare variety, it's actually relatively common here in the state of Hawaii. It's actually the first variety to come to the Hawaiian Islands. Late 1800, uh, dude on the big island wasn't trying to create some big like chocolate empire or anything like that. He was just like, oh, I got all this, you know, tropical property. I want all these, you know, exotic plants and oh, cacao tree. Sure, throw that on there too. So you know, it's actually been in the state for quite a while. But it didn't become a uh, industry here till like the mid late 90s with Dole. You guys know like Dole Pineapple mm -hmm. on Oahu. They have like a ton of land out there in central Oahu. And more and more they're doing their pineapple overseas and like Southeast Asia stuff just with like the labor costs and everything like that. I mean, of course, you get a pineapple around here that says Dole. It's probably from Oahu, but I'm talking about all the canned stuff on the mainland. That's that's probably Southeast Asia. So. They're all like, man, what do we do with all this expensive Hawaiian land? You know, we got to like switch to a higher dollar crop. And they landed in, on cacao and that's what they ended up going with. And that's when I first heard about it in 2004. And when me and my mom were kind of figuring out what we wanted to do with the, the uh, plantation here. I, in the uh, 70s, they had done papaya and stuff like that. And we were kind of debating if we wanted to do coffee or something. But uh, we're like, oh man, chocolate. I mean, we'd be picking chocolate bars off the branches. It'll be super easy, you know. A little bit more work than that, but it's all good, you know. It's a, it's a labor of love, you know. So um, and also, and so, Dole is the biggest producer of cacao in, in the U.S. Since Hawaii is the only place you can grow it. Um, and although they're like the big guy on the block, they're not like stomping out all the little guys or anything like that. If if anything, they've been a uh, pretty open resource to a smaller growers being like hey here's some problems we've run into growing this far north of the equator here's some solutions so i got nothing but good things to say about the guys over at dole um although a lot of their advice is pertaining to water related issues which hana water is our strong point you know you notice i don't have any drip irrigation or anything like that i yeah. just like sprinkler system goes off pretty much every night you know we're hitting up <laughs> summer so it's not uh, going off too much, but not having to pay for water is a huge cost avoidance for growing cacao because these things drink up water like nobody's business. I mean, it's truly a rainforest plant where I've had this bottom field like flood up during hurricanes and the trees are like singing in the rain, just <laughs> loving it, like sitting in a lake. So it's like, okay, they can't be over flooded and watered. So that's nice to know. But, uh, you know, but I'm sure a lot of the, their advice helps out the guys on the Big Island. There's a ton of little like micro growers like us on the Big Island. But as far as Maui goes, it's kind of like just started here. And from the point where you have like little baby trees to where they're actually able to produce fruit takes like three to five years yeah. right, to get to that point. You know, so it's definitely takes a long time to go, but the trees should last for quite a while. You know, it's like I'm, you know, we, They've only been growing cacao since the mid '90s in, in the first world, so we don't have a lot of information on how long they last. But in South America, there's trees that are over 100 years old still producing. So I'm guessing ours are going to be a little bit are going to be you know, like 40 or something. Either way, it's my daughter's problem. Like <laughs> these trees is kind of how I'm thinking of it. But uh, with the as far as yeah Maui, it's just kind of like just start up here. People are just getting their trees in the ground and. You know, there's a few people here in Hana where they're just starting to produce pods. But uh, so right now we're the only branch to bar chocolate on Maui, meaning we do everything yeah. from growing the cacao right up to making the bars. So I got to brag about that while I still branch can. Branch to bar is pretty rare in and of itself. Just anywhere in the world. Anywhere. Oh, yeah. No, I can imagine after going through all the steps, you're like, oh, my goodness, it's a lot of work, you know, and uh, I know like, yeah, it's 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 uh so we, what I love to do, you know. We're big chocolate fans. We have friends who are chocolatiers, and I have a friend who has a small chocolate producer um, in LA, and he does bean to bar. Mm -hmm. And he actually bought a share of a, of a plantation in Africa. Like he he like goes on single these crazy source. trips, single, yeah, single, yeah, single all single source, source yeah, and yeah. it's like he knows much the field. Respect, way. But respect. yeah, and he and, and he used to run the chocolate club at the old company I worked at, and he actually would bring in bars from all over the world, and we'd all have like tiny little pieces, and he'd like have a map showing us like where the different like plantation stuff came That's from <laughs> um you know it, it was an amazing experience but one of the things you know that he taught us we we're learning about is that m almost an insane amount of places that grow cacao have never even had chocolate 
like I, they I they, they don't they don't even like they don't even know what it's for. They grow the plant, they send the beans somewhere, and it was like the and there's uh, like videos online of like the people who pick the cacao, yep. like the first time they've had chocolate after like 30 years of picking the beans. I think I've it's seen that crazy. Video. Yeah. It was funny as I had a guest from Sierra Leone over here, and she's like, "Oh, my whole childhood, we'd crack these open and we'd suck on the beans and stuff, and even after all the explanation, only at the very end, she's like, "Wait, wait, wait, that's what you use for chocolate? You know, it's like it it, it was like I, I'm like, yeah, why do we crack open the pod and taste all this stuff she i guess she thought it was like uh fruit tasting time or something but yeah no i've, I've actually seen that video before as well so yeah you know I, I i definitely uh take a lot of pride in you know being able to do the whole aspect of it and i'm uh because i'm only 10 acres there's only so much i could produce so i try to you know we're kind of small time that's why i'm just here on maui you know it's like yeah. i can produce there's only so much i can produce and like I'm not all like I never want to his heads when we're doing the yeah. uh, deals here. So what I'll do is we just line them all up and play whack a mole all day. We give it a good crack, and you guys can see how thick that husk is oh, wow. that keeps the beans. And that yeah, it looks like something from an alien movie or something like that. But that thick husk keeps all the beans in that airtight environment, totally protected from you know bugs or like you know the air or anything like that. So you have. The cacao so beans. The pod oh yeah, no, they get they protect it really well. The cocoa butter. So what this mm -hmm. is actually is the miel de cacao. So if you guys would like, you take a bean and, mm, and you suck on it. It's actually pretty sweet there. I wouldn't bite down on the bean. It's not bad for you, but it's just a little bitter. But it has a nice sweet taste when you suck on it. Oh my god, that's so cool. Mm. Yeah. A little, bit, a little bit citrusy too. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. no, de definitely. Especially when you get to the last part of it. But whenever you're done, if you can throw the beans over here. You can see all the different people coming on a tour through beans over here. And now I got quite a bit of trees going on. So I got to put you guys to work since you're over here. Human I'm like, monkeys. get the planting, guys. You got to spit, monkeys. spit the beans. You can <laughs> eat it. Oh, just gnarly hippies like me are the ones that chew on those things. But, you know, it's not bad for you at all. It's just super bitter. But you can see all the people that have spit beans out. And I'll actually dig up some, some of the smaller ones, put them in my field up top. This one right here, someone spat this out about four years ago and now it's actually producing pods and everything. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's worked out pretty good on that end. So, so honey, a bean you spit out will become a cacao tree in Maui producing chocolate for like future generations and, and, and you know, for like the kids and stuff. For like 40 Spit years. For <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. I like that. Right. So right. now at this stage, what it is is we'll, I'll have a big old vat next to me and I'll be with holes at the bottom of it, and I'll pull out all this wet bean, throw it into the vat. As I'm pulling it out, I'm feeling around, making sure there's not sprouts coming out of it, which is perfect for planting. I'll put it in a separate bucket, but uh, it tends to give the chocolate a little bit more dirt, earthy taste, so it's definitely not what we want in uh, with the beans. And I just do that, and I wanna make sure there's a nice coat of miel, like you see uh, on the pods, that or the beans that we had here. That lets me know it's nice and fresh. And I can, um, and I just do that all from feeling, and I'm just like whoosh, 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 throwing it into the uh, vat. And as it gets filled up with these beans, what will happen is that sugar you guys are tasting over a period of about seven days with the natural occurring yeasts in the air will start to convert over to an ethanol. And that process generates a lot of heat where it'll get to like 120, 140 degrees on a day like today just from that natural occurring chemical process there. Yes. And so, now, growing cacao, honestly, in Hana, it's, 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 Hana does like 90% of the work for me. Like I said, I don't need to use any sort of like pesticide. Um, the soil here is great. I don't need to use any fertilizer. I don't have to pay for water. But once you get to the fermentation part, that's where you got, really got to get that elbow grease in. So you talk to a guy in Costa Rica, they'll be like, oh yeah, you can grow cacao in Hawaii, but it's impossible to ferment. It's too cold up there. And they're wrong. You can ferment here, but that's, you boy, you gotta like, I, I like sleep next to my ferment. Well, literally, since my house is right over there. But when the weeks that I'm doing ferment, I don't leave the property at all because I wanna stir it up, make sure that the heat's distributing evenly because it gets so cold over here. What I'm doing is I'm feeling around in the vat and feeling for the hot pockets and pushing them towards the cold pockets and vice versa to make sure that heat's distributing evenly, which is really important to make sure that fermentation takes. 
So after about seven days or so, I, the first three days it smells so citrusy and delicious in my hot house. By day seven, it smells like I'm brewing moonshine in there. It's like this potent <laughs> alcohol smell burning your eyes. You know, it's like I actually had like a guest from East Texas, and he's like, you know, y'all can turn that into gasoline. He explained this whole process. How I can convert the miel to gasoline. I'm like, can you live with me for a month? Help me figure this out. I'd love the idea of having like the miel running my like lawnmowers and weed whackers to make more miel. That was just awesome. But there's a level of backyard science way over my head. I can better explain the fermentation to you guys, you know. So during that seven day period of time, what I'm looking for is in the center of the bean, it's purple like you see here. And what will happen is it'll start to turn more of a brownish color. Mm -hmm. It'll start to leak this brown goo. And that's when I know that the fermentation's pretty much taken hold at that point. The next step is I gotta get these things on the drying racks where I have my drying racks in here in the hot house. but on a nice sunny day like today, I go, went ahead and brought out some of the beans drying here like you guys saw. So you can kind of see the different stages. These ones are, are, are still pretty pretty wet and they definitely have that uh, you know fermenty apple cider vinegary sort of smell. These ones are getting pretty close to good. But again, these things are gonna have another at least another two weeks, I'd say these beans right here so uh, yeah because again you know being Hana it's very humid here and I don't like to use any sort of mechanized drying systems that has a tendency to zap out some of those oils and the nibs that I don't want to hold on to later on in the process so we got to air dry them and it takes about three to five weeks to get to the dryness level that I like to have them it's a little bit shorter at this time of the year so which coincides to how frequently you are harvesting pretty much yeah it's it's interesting that it kind of works out like that but you know it's it's it all depends on the weather of course but uh now that, once they're all nice and dry I can move on to the next step which is the roasting part of it and I brought out a little tiny roaster to show what I like to use I use a little tiny roaster like this because uh, in the chocolate world, you only have two sizes, the $300 size and the giant don't fall in it size. <laughs> uh, I'm probably, I'm at the point, honestly, where I probably could use the giant roaster, but I've, I've, I've just fallen in love with these little tiny roasters because different times of the year, you're dealing with different like water densities of the beans, which can switch up my roasting times anywhere from 18 minutes and 15 seconds to 20 minutes and 30 seconds. And 15 seconds can be the difference between absolutely perfectly roasted and a little bit singed, you know? Approximately how many whole pods will fit? Well, let's see here. I, I, each pod has about 40 of those beans you have in there. I can do about a pound, I do about a pound and a half at a time. And I, I really like it because I can make these small little, like I, I like to just roast it, taste it. You know, if it needs a little bit more time, I could just do that with the next pound and a half. If it's a, a little bit on that, you know, it's been years since I've singed it, so that isn't so much of a problem. But I, I like to, the option of being able to make yeah. these little micro adjustments because you got the big roaster. If you singe those beans, you're not going to toss them. You know, you're, that's when the big guys are just like, oh, just dump in more sugar. They won't notice. You know, this is milk chocolate. You know, so it's like, you know, I, I like I said, I'm at the point I probably could use the big roaster. What I like to do, I just bought five more of these little roasters. So if I did want to, fire them all off at once and get a big roast going. I could do that, but I have a tendency to like to beat them up one at a time because it's so funny. Like I had this one for like five years and like literally tonnage has gone through it. A lot of tons have gone through that one as well. And man, they could just hold up really well and it's fun to see how long they last. So I'm just on my second one here since the whole, since the 2011, we've only, I've, this is my second one. So they oh, last a pretty long time. You That's know awesome. I mean? so, for a $300 machine? Yeah, for a $300 little coffee roaster. You yeah. know, you, as soon as you slap cacao on it, they can jack the price up on it. So I'm like, yeah, I'll just get the coffee one, you know. <laughs> so now that it's the, the beans have been fermented, dried, and roasted, let me go ahead and grab the beans. I'll be right back with you. Almondy looking thing. So if you guys hold out your hands here. Oh, I gotta get this. Yeah, it's okay. I'm, I'm rolling in cacao, so. <laughs> oh, these you're, a caca a you're, you're a cacaoianer? Yes, exactly. So if you smell it, it should be getting a little bit closer to more of a chocolatey smell here. And, oh, oh my god. god. A little hard on these ones. This is why I need my Krakenstein to do it. This is why I have a little machine that does that for me. But if you smell it, it should be getting to more of a mm -hmm. chocolatey sort of smell. And of course, this is the nibs here. Yeah, so it's good like, stuff. It is a finished food product. If you did want to eat the meat of the bean, you're welcome to go ahead. The shell, 
it's not bad for you or anything. It's just that I would avoid breaking a, breaking a bowl every couple months and running up the AC bill and stuff like that. But you know what? That's how I like my chocolate. And I get to inflict my opinion upon everybody else being the chocolate maker. So like, this is what I like to do. I like doing my five day belong, sometimes seven days. I'm kind of insane like that. But it really makes the, a textural difference so much where it's like people usually associate, oh, milk chocolate's the smooth stuff. Dark chocolate's kind of chalky. And it's like, no, oh, dark chocolate can be smooth too. You just gotta grind it out like nobody's business and it really makes a difference there so once i'm done melanging i'll slab it into dandelion just started doing it and like i feel like it makes it so it goes away quicker but i feel like it has such a good temper that it almost tastes like i don't want to say it tastes like it has a wax coating but it's like it's mm -hmm. so like it, 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 there's something blocking the chocolate and it has to yeah. really melt down. You have to like leave it in the sun in order to get it to the point where you really can taste the chocolate right when you get into it there. So I like to do the old school temper machine style. And instead of like, you know, just, just so I'm going quicker to meet up with my orders, I just get a bigger one so I can do more at once, you yeah. know, 40 pounds at once and stuff. So yeah, it takes about 10 to 11 hours and it breaks down those natural occurring fats when you add in the seed chocolate and all the, the crystals work together to, get it where you have it where when you pour in the bars because you know once you do the melange you could pour it into bar molds solidify them but as soon as you start handling them they like instantly get all melty you like try to break off a piece and just kind of go and, like muzzle up in your hands so that tempering process you know as you guys know gives you that nice glossy finish because that, that snap. snap you know and, and it actually acts as a natural preservative where the dark chocolate is all it has in it all is is the cacao and the organic cane sugar, and it's good for over a year and a half just playing with that 